Now, write this down. What is the prophetic implication of this year's prophetic word? You write this now and we begin to rain these prophetic blessings on you. What is the implication? There are four implications to this prophetic word. When God says it is our year of exceeding great rewards. Number one, it means it is a year of great consolation for those who have given themselves to live for and serve the Lord. Let me take it again. The first implication of this prophetic word is that number one, it means that this is a year of great consolation for those who have given themselves to live for and to serve the Lord. A year of great consolation for those who have given themselves to live for and to serve the Lord. A year of great consolation for those who have given themselves to live for and to serve the Lord. It is going to be a great time of reward for faithfulness and consistency. Still buttressing on that point. That is the summary of all I just said. A great consolation for those who have given themselves to live for and to serve the Lord. That you have served the Lord faithfully. You have served the Lord consistently. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 10. The Bible says God is not unrighteous. God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love which ye have showed towards his name in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. That means if God forgets you, it is unrighteousness on his part. And the Bible says God is not unrighteous. What is the first implication of the prophetic word? That it is a year of consolation for me. It is a year where God rewards faithfulness. God rewards consistency. Ready for number two? What is the second implication of this prophetic word? It is a season where God will bring the mockery and shame of many believers to a glorious end. It is a season, please write, where God will bring the mockery and the shame of many believers to a glorious end. Underline mockery, underline shame, underline believers, underline glorious end. It is a season where God himself will bring the mockery and the shame of many believers to a glorious end. We read earlier from Malachi chapter 3, 14 to 18 that there were people who were shouting in frustration and saying, does it really pay to serve Jesus? Does it pay to come to church? Does it pay to love him? Does it pay to live for him? Does it pay to walk in righteousness? Does it pay to walk in integrity? Does it pay to be a Christian indeed? This is a season where God will bring the mockery and the shame of many believers to a glorious end. Remember that there were many believers who were mocked in scripture. Noah was one of them. Whilst he was focusing his entire life building the ark of three stories made of gopher wood people mocked him mocked his wife mocked the sons mocked their wives but he was not under pressure he kept quiet and continued doing what he was doing when it was time for the flood the bible said it was god himself who shut the door and the heavens gave its rain the earth gave its rain everything in between aside from the ark perished Apostle, but people have laughed at me. They have mocked me. Don't worry, find rest. The Bible says, whatever you do to the least of my brethren, you have done it unto me. And so God will arise himself. And in this season, he will bring to end every mockery and every shame. And he will bring it to an end gloriously. There have been many glorious endings in the Bible. Let me list four of them for you. Are you ready? Number one. Abraham and Sarah for over 25 years they waited for a son ladies and gentlemen 25 years is a long time no matter how long you live that is a serious slice of your life and yet with the arrival of Isaac that covenant son God had done the life of Abraham 
and today whether it is christianity islam or judaism abraham is honored and respected as a father of faith in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed mockery and shame are we together let me give you one other example how about the man called gideon the bible says he was from the least in his father's house and his father's tribe was the least and they were hiding when God came to him and challenged him that he was a mighty man of valor and he went single-handedly together with 300 others, defeated the Midianites and made a name for the Lord through his life. Another example of mockery and shame, how about the woman called Ruth? When you read the story of Ruth, it's a very, very touching story because the Bible talks about a woman who was a righteous woman and then something tragic, it was a tragic season in her life. All the men in her life started dying, dying mysteriously. Her husband died, her children died, and the only person who was there to comfort her was Naomi, her mother-in-law. Hallelujah. Yes. And Naomi herself was widowed, she was sad, you know, and all of those, I mean, she felt sad and, and you know, she told Ruth and Oprah, I say, you people should just go and leave me. Just leave me. My life is an, an epitome of shame and reproach. Will I have other sons and have them grow for you people to now have husbands? Just go. And Oprah went her way and Ruth stayed and said, I'm not going anywhere. Your God will be my God. Your people will be my people. Are we together now? And as a result of that, you would think that was the end of Ruth's life. That was only seen one. By the end of Ruth's life, to cut the long short story short, she now became married to Boaz, and she now became part of those who were in the lineage, the genealogy of Jesus, the later part of her life. Very powerful, isn't it? That God is able to take reproach and shame. Perhaps the biggest of such was the man Job. Job. The Bible talks about a man who feared God and eschewed evil. Then the Bible tells us that tragedy struck in this man's life. Back to back, everything he had was lost. His children, sons, daughters, estates, cattle, everything. And then to make matters worse, his health now came. Join the list of all the things he had lost. To a point that the wife was discouraged and said, Why do you hold on to your integrity? She said, Curse God and die. And then the Bible tells us in a very beautiful and glorious way in Job chapter 42. When you read from verse 10 and 11 downwards, the Bible tells us that and the Lord restored. I like this. The Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends and the Lord gave Job twice. This is the, the, the expression of glory. Twice as much as he had before. And then... The Bible now starts to list a lot of things. He had sons again, daughters again, estates again. Everything he lost, literally, the Lord gave him twice. So the meaning of this is that everything that looks like shame and mockery in your life, in the name of Jesus, this is the year you will watch it die permanently. You will watch it die permanently. But it will not just end like that. It will end in praise and it will end in glory. Did you hear what I said? It will end in praise and it will end in glory. Listen, there are testimonies you are going to be hearing this year that whilst you are seated, no, no matter how hardened you are, tears of joy will come out of your eyes because there will be representations of God's restoring power, lifting power. That the things God is going to be doing in the lives of people, you will marvel and wonder. I know that God can change people's story, but you mean he can go this far? Hallelujah. This is the God that we believe is working with us this year in a very supernatural way. Number three, what is the prophetic implication or what is the implication of this prophetic word? Are you ready? So number one is a year of great consolation for those who have given themselves to live for and to serve the Lord. Rewarding their faithfulness and their consistency. Number two, it is a season where God will bring the mockery and the shame of many believers to a glorious end. Number three, 
Listen carefully to this. It is a season where God himself will judge and recompense the wicked and they that delight in evil against the saints. This is what God put in my heart. That it is not only a season of glory for the saints, it is a season where God himself will judge and recompense the wicked and all they that delight in evil against the saints. It is a season. This is the implication of being in a year of exceeding great rewards. It is a season where God himself will judge and recompense the wicked and they that delight in evil against the saints. I want to show you a very powerful scripture. There is something in the Bible called the reward of the wicked. Psalm 91 verse 8. The reward. The word reward does not just mean a gift. It means consequences. It means a harvest. Psalm 91 verse 8. Please give it to us. The Bible says, Only with your eyes shall thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. So it's not only the righteous that will be rewarded. The wicked will also be rewarded. Anybody who will not give you rest this year, God himself will arise in his vengeance and jealousy and bring those calamities to end. In the name of Jesus. Carry your Bible and read how God rewarded wicked people from Pharaoh to Nebuchadnezzar, to Herod, to the armies of Egypt. God rewards the wicked. He does not reward the wicked by giving them gifts. He rewards the wicked by bringing whatever gives them the basis of their, their, their troubling believers to end. Are we together? I'm reminded of the scripture that says, Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace always and by all means do you know what by all means means <laughs> now the Lord of peace himself give you peace how long always and by all means this is a very fearful statement when you really understand the revelation of this statement you'll be afraid of God when God says by all means, find out how many means he has. When the Bible says nothing shall by any means hurt you. Hallelujah. Oh, you'll find rest this year. In the name of Jesus. When Jesus was born, Herod heard that he was born. And the spirit of the Antichrist moved through Herod to look for the location where Jesus was lying that he wanted to also come and worship but the intent was to kill him and the bible says by a strategy of the spirit they took jesus away and hid him for about two years and then when god had killed herod it was an angel himself that came and said they that trouble the child are gone you can now live freely in the name of jesus for some of you god has been hiding you from powers that would have destroyed you this year they will come to an end permanently Your Bible says, let God arise and let his enemies be scattered. In the name of Jesus, for your sake, I'm saying it, let God arise. And let all his enemies over your life be scattered. It is a season where God will judge the wicked. Psalm 92 verse 7, let's hurry up. I want to speak over you. Psalm 92 and verse 7. Watch this. The Bible says, when the wicked spring as the grass, and when all the workers of iniquity do flourish, it is only so that they shall be destroyed forever. That means don't be afraid. When it looks like the wicked are getting away with it, and you are saying, God, are you not aware? God is saying, I am the one setting things up. I, I, I will use that downfall as a statement that there is only one God that rules over the affairs of men. Keep that scripture again. This is in your Bible. When the wicked spring forth as grass and all the workers of iniquity do flourish, it is that they shall be destroyed forever. So while Pharaoh was making his boasting 
I would destroy the nation of, each, of, of Israel and all the, with their chariots. He got angry when they left and he said pursue them. He did not know that it was the intelligence of God to drown them permanently in the sea. I'm saying it to anything that will not let you rest. May my God lay to rest this year. It is a season where God himself will judge and recompense the wicked and they that delight in evil against the saints. Number four. In fact, can I add one more scripture for you for number three? <laughs> Psalm 34 and verse 21. Evil shall slay the wicked and they that hate the righteous shall be desolate. This is not me, oh. this is your Bible. That like Haman, who has vowed that Mordecai will never rise. Like Haman, who has vowed that God's covenant people would die. While he was digging the pit, he did not know he was digging how he would die. While he was sleeping, he was rehearsing how Mordecai would die. And say, the first thing I'll do is to kill Mordecai then kill Esther, then kill the king. I believe Mordecai's ultimate vision was to be king one day. It was only a matter of time. Because when the king asked him what shall be done to the man who the king loves, he started describing all the king's properties. That means he had been looking at the horse, the royal robe, not knowing that he was digging a pit for himself. Every pit dug against you this year. While they are done digging it, they will fall into that same pit. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Number four. What is the implication of this prophetic word? That this is a season where the prophet that comes with loving and serving Jesus will be on full display. Drawing many to Jesus. Let me take it again. The fourth implication of this prophetic word is that this is a season or the season where the prophet that comes with loving and serving Jesus will be on full display. Don't forget this one. Serving Jesus pays. Loving Jesus pays. And this is the season where the prophet that comes with loving and serving Jesus will be on full display. Drawing many to Jesus. Isaiah 45 and verse 19. Let's look at Amplified. Isaiah 45 verse 19. I have not spoken in secret in the corner of the land of darkness. I did not call the descendants of Jacob to a fruitless service saying, seek me for nothing, but I promise them a just reward. I, the Lord, speak righteousness. The trust, trustworthy, straightforward correspondence between deeds and words. I declare the things that are right. You know what he's saying? KJV is where you get the word, I have not called the seed of Jacob. Yes. I said not to the seed of Jacob, seek me in vain. God never calls believers to seek him in vain. There is a reward. And this is the year that the prophet that comes with serving Jesus... The prophet that comes with loving Jesus will be on full display. I'm reminded of Exodus 23, 25 down to 28. And ye shall serve the Lord your God, and he shall bless your bread, he shall bless your water, and I will take sickness away from the midst of thee. There shall nothing cast her young nor be barren in thy land, the number of thy days I will fulfill. 27. I will send my fear before thee. And I will destroy all the people to whom thou shalt come. And I will make all thine enemies turn their backs unto you. Verse 28. And I will send hornets before thee. Which shall drive out the Hevites, the Canaanites, the Hittites. All from before thee. It pays to serve Jesus. 
It pays to love Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, please hear me. There are benefits to serving Jesus. Our ultimate motivation, I will repeat this for as long as I can. Our ultimate motivation behind loving and serving Jesus is that we truly love him for who he is. But I will emphasize for your learning that God will never call a people to serve him only because of love. He rewards. Are we together? He rewards. He rewards. I will never, never believe in a God who just says, come and serve me, come and worship me, and just do that. Don't mind what happens to you, whether you move. Now, I said that for a reason. Let me have your attention. I said that for a reason. If humans can be that thoughtful, even in the midst of such a sorrowful event, what kind of God was introduced to you that will allow you to serve him and be spent for him and there is no provision for your well-being? That is not the God we serve. If people can be that, you know, they can, they can sympathize with you knowing that people are coming for a burial and that they've traveled from far. Others would have spent their time and their life and after everything, they now say, well, there is something for you to refresh you at least on your way going. You don't come for a serious meeting with the plan to eat. You come to discuss business. But somewhere in that in Nigeria, we call it item seven. Is this still item seven now? Well, for many people it's now item 21. We full up all kinds of activities and it's when you are spent that they now say there's food. But is it not amazing? Listen, that in all of our plannings, you are considered irresponsible in Africa if you ever call for any kind of responsible gathering and not factor in something to refresh people, at the very least, water. Not even poverty is an excuse for leaving people in that state. We are that educated to know that every time you gather people, even if the reason for gathering is not your fault, the fact that they are coming to you, the responsibility becomes on you to make sure they do not live the way they come. Ladies and gentlemen, let's respect God. This God you see is not a wicked God. This God you see is not a cruel and self-centered God instinctively even culture and culture beyond the bounds of religion every religion i know in ways great and small promote hospitality you are commended when you are hospitable it is the one factor that binds most cultures across the globe i've traveled a bit and when i go to cultures they try to show hospitality and honor in many ways Sometimes they dress me. Sometimes they give me their local food. They do whatever. They devise the skill to show you you are welcome. May God himself tell you thank you this year. You need to be a politician to understand what I just said. There are ways that once you come, especially politicians, after they greet you, say, well, uh, I have a little thank you somewhere, just a cup of water, and uh, please make sure you look at it. When men say thank you, you know what that means. Thank you can mean anything. Businessmen too can say, well, I just something small for the charge card. And for some, you open it and it will change your life immediately. <laughs> Am I right on that? Yeah. Every man blesses according to his riches. So when God tells you thank you, God does not consider himself too big to tell the saints thank you. It is clear in scripture that he commends people and he acknowledges the fact that he's touched and grateful for their commitment. When a rich man tells you thank you, thank you can mean go and carry that house. Thank you can mean take a car. Thank you can mean whatever you want. Thank you can mean sponsor your children. As men, as frail as we are, we have told certain people thank you and even in our own little capacity that thank you has meant something miraculous in their lives not to talk of God